This TV show that we just gave you was extraordinarily entertaining. And I really hope that the legacy that it leaves behind is not one that shows war as glorious. Because there's nothing more dangerous than a democracy that thinks this is a glorious thing to do. War is ugly and it's dangerous. And in this world, the way we are, di we are discussed on the Arab street, it feeds and fuels their hatred and their desire to kill themselves to take out Americans. It's a dangerous thing to propagate. I hope diplomacy's not dead. I hope that Colin Powell at one point would like to continue revisiting the French. I hope that he has success in Syria at some point with Bashar Assad, whenever that meeting is going to happen. And I sure hope we focus on the Middle East. And I sure hope that some kind of peace plan is revisited and attention is paid, American attention is paid to the plight of the Israelis and the Palestinians on an equal basis and that some kind of resolution is made there because that is the root of so much of the anger. For right or wrong, it's the selling point of all of the dictators and despots and leaders overseas. They use that as a pawn any chance they get. Osama loves to sell the Palestinians' cause. I don't even think he cares a hoot about the Palestinians, believe it or not, but he, he uses it for his, his cult following to increase his leadership. That is something that we don't understand the power of overseas, and we must. And television has to play a better part in that. We haven't been back to the West Bank since Operation uh, Defensive Shield last year. And it's been a good solid year since we gave you wall-to-wall -wall coverage on what's been going on in the West Bank and Gaza. Hell, we just raided Rafah again. I mean, the Israelis had an incredible raid in Rafah, one of the deadliest in, uh, in years, but it barely made headlines here. Again, it is, it is crucial to our security that we are interested in this, because when you are interested, I can respond. If I put this on the air right now, you'll turn it off and we'll lose our numbers. As we're finding, we're losing now, the numbers being uh, so much lower than they were last week. There is another whole phenomenon that's, that's come about from this war. Many talk about it as the Fox effect, the Fox News effect. I know every one of you has watched it. It's not a dirty little secret. <laughs> a lot of people describe Fox as having streamers and banners coming out of the television as you're watching it cover a war. But the Fox effect <clears throat> is very concern, concerning to me. I'm a journalist and I like to be able to tell the story as I see it. And I hate it when someone tells me I'm one-sided. It's the worst. It's the worst I can hear. Fox has taken so many viewers away from CNN and MSNBC because of their agenda and because of their targeting the market of cable news viewership that I'm afraid there's not a really big place in cable for news. Cable is for entertainment as it's turning out, but not news. I'm hoping that I will have a future in news in cable but not the way some cable news operators wrap themselves in the American flag and patriotism and go after a certain target demographic, which is very lucrative. You can already see the effects. You can already see the big hires on other networks, right-wing hires, to try to chase after this effect. And you can already see that flag waving in the corners of those cable news stations where they have exciting American music to go along with their war coverage. Well, all of this has to do with what you've seen on Fox and its successes. So I do urge you to be very discerning as you continue to watch the development of cable news, and it is changing like lightning. But be very discerning because it behooves you, like it never did before, to watch with a grain of salt and to choose responsibly and to demand what you should know. That said, I know that there's probably a couple of questions. Uh, no one's allowed to ask about my hair color. OK? I'm kidding. If you want to ask, you can. It's a pretty boring story. Um, but I just wanted to, to say thank you. And, and, and let's all pray and hope in any way that you pray or hope.
for, for peace and for democracy around the world and for more rain this summer in Manhattan. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. We'll get some questions here. Sure. Well, Ashley, thank you very much for a superb Landon lecture. Very informative and just excellent. Well, a as you know, we have microphones on your right and on your left. So if you would please step up to the microphone to ask your questions. And it looks like we have the first question right over here. Please. Is it on? Talking to um, I think I saw a piece you did. You were on the back of a truck and you were watching somebody be executed. It might have been in Afghanistan after the regime had left, or, or it might have been right while they were leaving. But this family had to ex execute a family member? It, it's a little misleading only because I was definitely on the back of a truck, and I was in the Olympic Stadium in Kabul, right. and it was where the Taliban had uh, performed Friday executions. Yes. So there were blood stains in the middle of the field, but the Taliban was gone, and there was no one. Uh, the executions had ended with the Taliban's fall. There was nobody in the stadium being executed. It was a soccer game. Thank God a soccer game had returned to the stadium instead of the execution. I remember that piece, and I wanted to ask you, how, do, how did you deal with what you saw and what you heard? Uh, it's obviously affected you, but how did you deal with that? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question because, um, you know, journalists are supposed to be very unbiased and very unaffected and, and able to deal with this uh, like a soldier, but we didn't have the training that soldiers had. You know, we didn't go in there um, as hardened as perhaps we should have been. So I think that the way I dealt with that was keeping busy, believe it or not. Uh, we had an awful schedule in Afghanistan. It was a nightmare. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. In order to put an hour-long program on the air in a different location every night, uh, the logistics had to be figured out during the day, hours, and so did the news coverage. We had to conduct our interviews, travel and shoot and edit and set up the show for that night. But then during the nighttime hours, we had to physically go past curfew, clear these different checkpoints, get to the locations, set up the gear, plan the show for an hour on a satellite phone, deliver the show for an hour, break the show down, and by the time we'd broken it all down, it was about 7 o'clock in the morning local time, which doesn't leave you any time for sleeping. So what we found is that we could get a two-hour nap in the morning at about 9 a.m. We'd begin our day, and then we'd get a two-hour nap at about 11 p.m., and we'd begin our night. And I think it was because of those grueling hours and how taxing they were on us physically and mentally that I didn't have a lot of time to process um, some of the horrors that had been visited upon these people. I think there were certain times when, you know, I was so exhausted that I might have gone to sleep with a tear, but uh, I think a lot of that came afterwards and a lot of conversations with my family. Um, but you certainly don't walk out of something like that not changed. I, I'm enormously changed, for the better and for the worse. Did you find that being a woman was harder because, like Mike Savage called you a slut and a prostitute? Uh, if you were a man, do you think you would have been seen as ambitious rather than as just being a typical female? I think Michael Savage would have called me an idiot if I were a man, because that's about the extent of his lexicon. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll tell you right now, I think the greatest offense that I took to those comments were not what he sees about me politically, um, because I am apolitical. My greatest offense was that I had spent 15 years to date grinding my way through this business with some of the worst experiences and some of the best experiences and some of the toughest experiences and some of the hardest work that I'd ever done and some of the most successful work that I'd ever done limited to simple comments about sex. And I don't know if anyone has ever had this happen, but there is nothing more degrading than having all of your hard work and successes downgraded to one word, like slut, publicly, on your own airwaves, without an apology that followed, without an admission of wrongdoing. That's what was most difficult. And yes, being a woman makes that more difficult. 
than being a man. Because again, it's all about sex. And it's all about that being an appropriate way to describe a woman's work. I don't know if you can tell that I'm mad. <laughs> but I'm burning. <laughs> yes, go ahead. I have a question. Um, why did we not see the picture of Rumsfeld shaking hands with Hussein? Uh, this was, I believe, after he gassed the Kurds and Iranians and the Shiites when he was Assistant Secretary of State for uh, mm -hmm. Reagan. And would this be due to the fact that a lot of the news corporations, such as NBC, is owned by General Electric, and that Rumsfeld is a key figure in the corporate-friendly Bush administration? That's a great question, but I, I wish I could answer you with logistics. I don't know if the pictures exist in video. Um, they were on The Daily Show. They got them. Oh, were they great? <laughs> That's one of my favorites. And I don't know that we haven't aired them. I, I'm shocked because I have free reign to air those pictures anytime I want. I've got free reign to air any of those pictures. And I would not suggest for a moment that there's any kind of collusion between Don Rumsfeld and, uh, well, and what would have been Jack Wright at that time, um, and now, uh, or Jack Welsh, and now Bob Wright of NBC. No, uh, without question, that would be something that we would show. And I think perhaps Fox News Channel might not want to, just because of its audience and the palatability of that kind of material. But we've shown a lot of things that have been um, not preferred by the administration. That's also a story that is repeated over and over. I mean, there were more than just handshakes, by the way. There was money, and there was, I mean, everywhere. Afghanistan, look, we trained Osama. We trained him. We talk about it all the time. And I know that we've talked about Don Rumsfeld's meeting with Saddam Hussein back then. But at the time, Saddam Hussein was a secular state. And at the time, it looked like it was possible that this might be uh, an ally in the fight against uh, the Islamic Republic next door. Yeah, and I don't know about the date. Did you talk about the Halabja attack where 5,000 died? I don't know if that was known. I know that we didn't know about that at the time. I know we didn't know that those Kurds had died at the time. Um, and I don't know whether Rumsfeld was aware of it or was turning a blind eye or trying to keep that away from us. And again, it's all about why, why were we not showing pictures and discussing the time frame of this. I don't know that. And, and quite frankly, I don't know that we didn't show those pictures. I know that we did discuss it. It's been discussed several times on the air. But, but I would like to say without question, and I'm, I've done a show that was all about this region and all about the shortcomings of American foreign policy and the successes of American foreign policy, I would have aired that ad nauseum. So no, there's no restrictions. I'm never told what I can't put on the air with those pictures, et cetera. So if, there, if they were limited, I'm not sure why. I'll find out, though, if you give me your number. Please. I just have two quick questions. The first, earlier you talked about how our message should have been that we should free the Iraqi people. But my question to you is, if that would have been the message that we would have sent to the UN as opposed to weapons of mass destruction, which would affect everybody, you feel that the UN would have gone along with our first resolution. And secondly, probably the biggest thing that you talked about was bias in the media, whether we see it as liberal or right-wing bias. Will we ever see a news station ran by journalists and not by corporate executives? Hmm. Probably not. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know that you're ever going to see a news organization that doesn't need to, um, to eat. You know, journalists need to eat. So, and we all, we all weigh what's good and bad for us. And we were, we've been talking at length, the platform party, and, and I have been talking about Easton Jordan's recent letter to the New York Times about what he withheld and what CNN withheld in order to continue coverage of, of Iran, or of Iraq and of Saddam Hussein's regime and to continue getting access for coverage. It's a give and take thing, and I think that's always going to be the case with journalists. Look, it's not a perfect science. It's not a perfect world. And I don't think you're ever going to have, you know, perfect altruism in journalism. You, you do your best. You do your best, and you try not to stomp on too many feet. Um, do corporate executives put that much pressure on us? Personally, no. But then with the hire of Michael Savage, yes. You know, I, I see that as, as, a, as a corporation that's willing to have somebody who's almost about to burn a cross on TV, and it's acceptable. So, yeah, I don't know that we're ever going to get away from that, especially, especially as it becomes more and more competitive. And your first question was, um, what was it again? With, it, with the message of freeing the Iraqi people. I don't think that would have made a hoot of difference. I don't think any of this was about good or bad. It was all about money. 